Today we're going to begin our summer series, and it's entitled Journey with the Faithful. Over the next three months, <clears throat> June, July, and August, we're going to be looking at the lives of a number of people in the Bible, both men and women. Each of them chose to leave their comfort zone and follow God and do what he wanted them to do. We always refer to that as leaving your comfort zone for the faith zone, a place where you have to trust God as he leads you. He doesn't always give you all the answers up front. <clears throat> Each of these people had to get up and go. They were in a certain place in life, and they couldn't accomplish what God wanted them to do unless they were willing to get up and then to go and do what God asked them to do. Throughout the first part of the year, we've likened that unto moving from here to there. And we don't always know where there is. It's, uh, and we don't know what's going to happen to us along the way. So journey with the faithful, looking at uh, men and women who followed God and people that we remember many, many years later. Uh, during the first part of the year, we used a bridge uh, to convey the idea of crossing over from one side to the other. Bridges come in all shapes and all sizes. I remember the first time I ever saw the Mackinac Bridge. It, it was a stunning sight for me, and it literally took my breath away. Same feeling I had when I saw the Golden Gate. Each bridge always conveys the thought of crossing over from one side to the next. You're going over some obstacle to reach an opportunity on the other side. And that may just be a further in your destination. That could be a new job. That could be a new relationship. But as we talk about it in the Christian sense, we understand that God is guiding us. And the bridge represents that transition from one place in life to another. God saved us not so that we could just have a good time, but he saved us so we could have a relationship with him and then to live out the mission and the purpose that he has for our life. He has something for us at every juncture. He has something for us at the end of every bridge. And that's to accomplish his will. It's not just to uh, live life to the fullest for our own benefit. So think of these questions, if you will, as they relate to a bridge. When was the last time you crossed over a bridge? And think of any bridge. It could have been a major bridge. It could be a little bridge. When was the last time? So in your mind right now, think about that. And then follow that with this set of questions. Uh, where were you and where were you going? Where were you and where were you going before, you know, as you came to that bridge, where were you? And then what was the destination that you were headed to? Then what obstacle did the bridge span? For most of us, it's a little creek or it's, it's a river around here. But for some of us, it's a big river. For others, it, it could be over some um, highway. But when was the last time you crossed over a bridge? And what was that obstacle? Because you would not have been able to get to the other side because of the obstacle. So a bridge allowed you to get there. Then you have to ask yourself, why did you cross over? Well, it's kind of like, the why did the chicken cross the road, I know, to get to the other side? But really, something was motivating you. What was it? Was it to see somebody, to get to work? Was it to a new destination? When you cross a bridge, there's always a reason. So you have to ask yourself, why? And as we look at these men and women, we've got to ask that question. Why were they willing to cross over? And ultimately, how did you cross over? Did you walk? Did you take a bike? Did you uh, go by car, etc.? If you've got your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 12. We're going to look in the first nine verses. We're going to look at the uh, story of a guy by the name of Abram. We call him the first bridge walker in this series. A man by the name of Abram. You and I know him as Abraham. And we're going to, I'm, as I read this passage, I'm going to be using the New Living Translation primarily in this passage. I'll refer to a couple of other verses, and we'll go to the NIV occasionally. Abraham is an important man in Scripture. Outside of Jesus, probably the most important person in all of Scripture. He is esteemed and followed by people in the Christian faith, in the Jewish faith, and in the faith of Islam. Abraham is mentioned about 300 times in the, in the Scripture. And if you had a dictionary and, and a picture were to come up around the word faith, if you were to look up the word faith and a picture was there illustrating it, you would see Abraham's portrait. 
He's called a man of faith, a great man of faith. Hebrews chapter, or I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 12 through 25, that many chapters um, cover his life from beginning to end of what we know about him. And then he's referred to many times throughout the rest of Scripture. <clears throat> As a human being, we read of his achievements, we read of his triumphs, his failures, and also his encounters with humanity and with God. He encountered many people throughout a wide range of, of uh, the Middle East. And these chapters, Genesis 12 through 25, take us on a journey. If we read in Genesis 15, 16, here's what we learn about Abram. Abram believed the Lord. In other words, Abram had faith. And the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. And this is a great truth. People who are made right with God are not, um, do not have that take place because of their good works or because of their money or their prestige or their position. They uh, are made righteous with God by their faith in him and in the things that he has said. And Abraham is the poster child, if you will, for this idea of faith. Let me read to you Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, as it relates to Abraham. It's telling us uh, the book of Matthew is all about the Jewish people. The writer Matthew is letting the Jewish people know about Jesus, and he starts the book off with these words, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, okay? I'm going to tell you all about Jesus. Jesus, he says, the Messiah, the son of David and the son of Abraham. The author wants all the Jewish people to understand who Jesus is. So he tells us three things. Number one, he's the Messiah. Number two, he uh, references the greatest king that Israel was aware of and says that he is a son or a descendant of David, which helps the Jewish people understand they are related uh, to uh, Jesus in the sense of his authority, his kingship. But then he goes on, he says, uh, about Jesus. He is the son of Abraham from whom all Jewish people came from. Well, that's, that's what I call the trifecta. He's the Messiah. He's the son of David. And he's also the son of Abraham. Abraham is mentioned again when you go to, to, further in the New Testament to Hebrews chapter 11. That we know as Christians as a great faith chapter. It lists many of the people, both men and women in scripture, who had tremendous faith in God. In that chapter, it defines faith. It illustrates faith. And Abraham has the biggest section of that chapter devoted to him from verse 8 through verse 19. Faith and Abraham go hand in hand, sort of like peanut butter and jelly. They're inseparable. And to sum up Abraham's life, uh, twice in Scripture, it uses this phrase. He is the friend of God. I, I don't believe there's anybody else in the entire Bible that is mentioned as the friend of God, he's mentioned twice. And then in Romans 4, uh, 11, it says this, of Abraham. He is the spiritual father of those who have faith. Now, this is an important person that we're talking about, both Old and New Testament. The word faith is associated with him. Without Abraham, we would have no idea really of how a person could be reconciled in their relationship with God. And Abraham illustrates that for us. So this morning, we're going to look at Abraham's journey of faith. How did he come to be this great man of Scripture? Um, how did, what is faith? How do we see it illustrated in his life? And we're just going to look at some basic truths regarding Abraham's life of faith and then draw some lessons from that for you and I today. A friend of God. I don't know what you want on your tombstone, Okay. Uh, but to have these words, this person was a friend of God, would be incredible. And we learn from the life of Abraham what it takes to be called a friend of God. So three simple lessons. Um, the first lesson is the sovereignty of God's call. So if you're in Genesis chapter 12, we're going to look at the first three verses here. Now, on the screen, you should be seeing a map. It looks very similar to modern-day Syria today. And this is where Abraham grew up. And if you look at that map in the lower right hand, we would call the southeastern corner, is the city that is associated with Abraham. 
Scripture tells us that Abraham lived nearly 40 centuries ago. That's a long time. 40 centuries, darn near 4,000 years ago. He lived in a city called Ur, U-R of the Chaldeans. Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, this Chaldean people were just a, a group of people who lived in, the, in this region of what we might know as Syria today. And this is where uh, Abram grew up. This is where his family is associated. And the city in which he lived, Ur, was on the Euphrates River, major river in the Middle East. Uh, we call this uh, the um, Mesopotamian. This is where most ancient civilizations were founded in this region. Um, Syria and modern-day Iraq is this entire region here. So Syria would be more to the north, and we were very familiar with the country of Iraq because of the recent wars. All of this was this kingdom, this area in which Ur was located. Historians tell us that Ur was one of the most important cities uh, in the ancient world. It, it was, in Abram's day, it was a metropolitan area. It had a large city center and then a huge area. We, we would, today would call it the suburbs that surrounded Ur, this city alone had 250,000 inhabitants. So you and I have to imagine how big that was. It was a very, very industrialized city. Uh, it was a trade center. It was very wealthy, a center of commerce. It had a, a large university, a library. Uh, it was a center for mathematics, for astronomy, for international commerce. Today, if we were to think of Ur in... in um, cities and make it similar to cities we know today. In Southeast Asia, we would think of Singapore, uh, who reaches all of the Southeast Asian countries. Here in the United States, we might think of New York. In Europe, we might think of London. A cosmopolitan area, huge, has just tremendous trade, all the finances, all the uh, um, trade going through this one particular city. Ur was also the center of pagan worship. Now, on the screen, you should see a picture of the temple that was prominent in the time of Abram. The lower part, uh, portion of this temple still exists today, 4,000 years later. In fact, if you remember Desert Storm and in, in, uh, some of the recent conflicts over there, there are many pictures of U.S. troops who... Um, in between battles and whatever, we're in this area resting, and we would see them uh, uh, marching uh, or hiking up and down these steps to view this area. Uh, it's called a ziggurat. Uh, the shape of this is a ziggurat. It's like a pyramid, but it's a pyramid that goes up, and then it has steps, and it goes up again, and it has steps. And this was a place where Nana, now think of the name Nana. Many people would call their grandmother Nana. That may not have been a popular name that way back in this culture because Nana was the moon god that was worshipped in this entire region. And this was a central location where all people who were pagan idolaters would come and worship this god of theirs. In Genesis 13 and verse 2, here's what we read about Abram. In this Ur of the Chaldeans, in a commercial city, a metropolitan city, we read that Abram was very wealthy in livestock and in silver and in gold. He's a wealthy tradesman. In Genesis 14, 14, we see that he had many servants. In fact, out of his base of servants, he trained 318 of them just to be like what we would call his elite bodyguard. So if we put that in today's terms, he's a powerful individual, somebody that was uh, so wealthy he could have his own little private army to protect him, to protect his goods. Uh, we read about him in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 2. We read about Abraham and his father. His father's name was Terah. And Joshua is towards the end of his life. We studied his life earlier here at church. And he's summing up the Jewish culture as he's preparing to, uh, for his last days, he's preparing the children of Israel to uh, take over and, and now fully inhabit the land of Cana, the promised land. And he's summing up their history. And in Joshua 24, 2, here's what we read. 
Joshua said to the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abram, and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshiped other gods. The family background of Abraham was that they were idol worshipers. They were pagans, had no clue about God. In fact, they worshiped everything imaginable. And in particular, in the city of Ur, it was the moon god that uh, was their favorite god, and it was the center of all that they did in terms of their business practices and in their faith. Other things we learn about Abram as we uh, get the background on his life, to learn about how he became the father of the Jewish people, how he became the poster child of faith. We know that Abram was about 70 years old when we are first introduced to him in Scripture. For 70 years, he's lived as a pagan. For 70 years, he's an idol worshiper. For 70 years, he's a wealthy man. He has everything that humanly, in this world, we would want. Fame, prestige, wealth, family, etc. We read in Acts chapter 7, verses 2 through 4, that <clears throat> when he became, uh, when he reached about the age of 70, God began to work in his life. Now, here's what Scripture tells us. No one seeks after God. God seeks you. God draws people to himself. Nobody wakes up any morning of their life and says, I think I'll look for God today, unless uh, as the Bible says, God is pulling on their, their uh, spirit and drawing their mind and drawing their heart towards him. He's about 70 when he and his family move from Ur and they begin on a northwesterly direction and they come to the city of Haran, which is about uh, 600 miles away in southern Turkey. 600 miles God, God has been speaking to his life in Ur, begins to pull on him, and Abram begins to s respond to God's call on his life. Now, 600 miles. I did s some um, looking this week. How far is that from Nashville? If you were to drive from here to Nash, or uh, from Nashville to Minneapolis, Minnesota, that's about 600 miles. He didn't drive. He had to walk. So imagine that. If you had to walk from Nashville, Michigan to Knoxville, Tennessee, again, it's about 600 miles. Or if you had to walk more in an easterly line, you would go from Nashville, Michigan to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So in your mind's eye, if you're good with geography, you can kind of figure that out. That's a long way. He goes 600 miles to Haran with his family, responding to God's movement in his life, and what we learn is this, he's only halfway to where God wants him to go. So you have to ask yourself, why would a wealthy, settled, middle-aged man, because in this culture, 70 was considered middle-aged because they lived longer than what we do today. Why would that person leave their business? Why would they leave their country? Why would they leave the prospects of, of retiring and living out your final days in your homeland? and then only end up after 600 miles halfway to where God wants you to go. Our point, our first point, is the sovereignty of God's call. The sovereignty of God's call. The word sovereignty means somebody has supreme authority. They have the legal right to exercise power, to give edicts, to make demands. You and I as Americans, we really don't get that because we're so far removed from the, the time when we uh, lived, when our ancestors lived in Europe and there were monarchs who had the right uh, to order you to do whatever they wanted, the power of life and death. That's what a sovereign is. They have ultimate power. And we know this, Abram is in the city of Ur and God begins to speak to his life. He leaves there. He goes to the city of Haran with the rest of his family. From age 70, he's now 75 in south, in southern part of Turkey. And now we're in Genesis chapter 12, the first three verses. God, the almighty creator, the Lord of the universe, the sovereign one, in verse 1, says to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, 
and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Through, uh, you. <clears throat> Here's what we're learning. We're learning something about God. Not only that God has the right as our creator to ask us to do whatever he wants us to do, but we learn some other things about God. Abram's living in the midst of paganism. He's living as a wealthy man. He's living without any thought towards the one true God, and God breaks through into his life and calls him. Here's some insights. If you read those first three uh, verses, here's what you can learn about God. He knows of us and our life here on earth. God knows every detail about your life. He knows where you live. He knows whether you paid your taxes. He knows how much you got back or how much you had to pay in. He knows what your thoughts are. He knows your family members. He knows every step of your life. God knows us, and he knows about our life here. You see, in the midst of this pagan city of 250,000 people, he knew Abram. And here's what else he knew about Abram. He didn't just know where he lived. He knew that if he called Abram, that Abram would respond. This is called the sovereign call of God. When God looks at you, he understands your heart. God begins to call you. Whether he calls you audibly, he speaks within your heart, or he speaks through the pages of Scripture, God draws people to himself. Another thing we learn about God, he desires to have a relationship with each of us. And that, to me, is one of the most fascinating, fascinating things about Christianity. And that's what drew me to the faith, is that God knows us, and he knows everything about us, and he still wants to have a relationship with us. Then he, we learn that he understands that we're separated from him, that we're sinful, that we live in a uh, um, pagan-soaked culture. He's very aware of our sin. And yet God still loves us and he still cares about us. We learn that he wants to guide us through life. He wants to guide us. He, want, he has a bigger purpose for our life than just where we live today. He has a bigger purpose than just going to, job, or going to a job and earning a paycheck. He has a bigger purpose than getting out of high school or going into the military or going to, um, on to college and getting a degree. This life is not all there is, and God has a purpose for each of us. And then he expects us to obey him, even when he doesn't give us all, all of the answers ahead of time. He knows we have questions, and he simply says this, if you love me, if I am truly the Lord Almighty, then I'm asking you to follow me and trust me. That's not blind faith. Our faith is in God a God who has proven himself over and over. The call of faith really says something about our heart. Who really is in control of our life? Is it ourselves or is it God? So God's sovereign call is very clear. It demands a wholehearted response from all of us. It's a decision that determines the quality of life here and the destiny of our life in eternity. When God calls you, when God speaks, when he asks you to do something, whether it's to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, or now that you are a Christian, put your faith in him and serve him in your community and serve him in your church, he expects obedience. Those that are lost, Acts 17, 30 through 31, here's what it says. God commands everyone, everywhere, to repent of their sins and turn to him. That's what God demands. He's the sovereign. He can make that call. He demands that people turn from hell and find life in him. Now, the choice is yours. He, he, he gives you the choice. But how do we stand in front of God and say, I know that you love me. I know that you wanted a relationship with me. I know that you allowed your son to die for me. I know that you command me to put my faith and trust in him but I didn't want to. I wanted to keep on sinning. I wanted to keep being selfish. How will you stand in front of God and account for that when his sovereign call has asked you to turn from that? 
As Christians, we're told in James 1.22, don't just listen to God's word. Just don't go to church. Just don't read the Bible. Just don't listen to some sermon somewhere on radio, TV, or on the internet. It goes on and says, you must do what it says. God wants more from our life than to give lip service to him. Number one, he expects us to put our faith in him. Number two, then he wants us to serve him in whatever direction he wants us to go. That's what the sovereign, of call, the sovereign call of God means. God has the authority. He has the right to call us out of our sin to follow him. And as we follow him, he has the right to give us the direction that he wants us to go. Lesson two is this, the evidence of Abram's commitment. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, 5, and 6. Remember, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. The evidence of Abram's commitment. <clears throat> it says this, God called him, verses 1 through 3. Verse 4, so Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. Now think about that. He's a pagan. He's wealthy. He's above virtually all people in his region. God called him and he obeyed. God called him and he obeyed. God speaks to every one of us weekly, if not daily, speaking into our lives, telling us what he wants us to do. So you've got to measure your life, if you're a Christian, your life of faith against these words. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. And Lot, one of his relatives, went with him. Abram was 75 years old now. He's in Haran when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth. God doesn't call you to be poor. God calls you to be obedient. Whether you are poor, whether you're middle class or you're rich, Wealth doesn't matter that much with God. Whatever you have managed to earn in your life is what you have managed to earn with your own decisions. God doesn't bless some and not some others. He doesn't have a giant piggy bank where he empties it on one person and not to another. He gives us all the ability to think. All of us have the energy and the creativity to work. It says, Abram took all of his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran, and he headed for the land of Cana. We see Abram's commitment here by his desire to take those that were closest to him. All right, God has a purpose for my life. I'm going to take as many friends and family with me as I can. Now, as a Christian, you've got to ask yourself, is that your mentality? God's called you into faith. God has called you out of your sin. God's calling you on to heaven. Is it your desire to take friends and family with you, or are we being selfish and hoarding all of God to ourselves? Good lesson we can learn here from Abram. He had to reorder his priorities. Okay, he had lived in Ur, then he had lived in Haran. Each time required a move. He was willing to do it. He had to reorder his life around God's call and not about his own self-centered wishes. And then he had to go in the direction that God was leading. Now, I'm sure as a man who, has, who is responsible for many lives and you have all these animals and all this stuff with you, you're worried about that. Where am I going to feed these animals? I haven't ever been this way before. Is there a McDonald's along the highway? I don't know. He would have had fears. He would have had worries. But our fears and worries should never stand between us and our obedience to God's will. Now think about this for a moment. God has called this guy to follow him. Can you imagine the conversation? God speaking. Hey, Abe, this is the one true living God, the Almighty One, the Creator, I'm not one of those wannabe fakes that y'all are worshiping here. Abraham's looking around going, okay. God, I want you to pack up only what you and your mates can carry with you. I'm going to take you to a land. It's called Cana. Can you see Abraham's face? Where's that at? God, if I told you, you probably wouldn't believe me. Here's Abram. He's a businessman. Try me. 
God. It's about 1,200 miles from here. It's a place called Cana. It's going to take you a while to walk there because remember, it's not just you. You're going to take some, some uh, camels with, loaded with some stuff and some of your family members. What was that again, Abram says? Cana? Where's that at? God. I know, Google Maps hasn't been invented yet. Uh, but guess what, Abram? What? I'm going to make you a father and a father of nations. All of this is running through Abram's mind. I can hear Abram muttering under his breath, dude, I'm old. He's thinking of Sarah. She's old. We take a lot of naps now. I can see God smiling. Yeah, I know. That, this really isn't about you and what the missus can do. It's about me. Abram, whew, good thing. God, don't worry. Just have faith. I sort of major in the miraculous. Now Abram's really looking at him. So you just want me to stop what I'm doing, drop all of my responsibilities, and roll on out of her? You can just see him processing this. God, very simple. Yep. Abram, how am I going to explain that to my wife? God, with a big smile, that's your problem. The rest is history. The entire Jewish faith, Christian faith, came out of this one man's obedience. You see, the evidence of our commitment and our obedience to God is not how well we can talk the game. It's whether we're walking in obedience. Anybody as a Christian can say, well, you know, I'll follow you, God, when I retire. I'll follow you, God, and I'll serve in the church when my children get older. Anybody can say that. Abram departed. Abram obeyed. He went whenever God told him to go, and he didn't rationalize all of his life and weigh that against God's call. He simply said, here's all of my life. Here's what God says. I'm willing to forsake it for him. Ask yourself, how are you responding to God's call to be a youth worker, to be a children's worker, to work on the maintenance teams, inside or outside here at the church, to be on our prayer team, to join a home group, to be part of one of our Grace University classes. How are you responding to God's obedience? This next Sunday, we have a tremendous opportunity here at Grace. We're going to do an online service like this, and then our church is going to uh, be asked to go to one of seven communities on Tuesday of this week, you're going to hear about that. And you'll be able to register on Tuesday. What community do you want to serve in? And next Sunday, after this service, having registered, you get to go to the community of your choice, and we're going to pick up that community. We're going to pick it up by taking trash bags and picking up trash. We're going to be there and pick up people that we see and encourage them. I'll give them a, a friendly smile, have a conversation with them. We're going to pick up the community by gathering and praying for it. You see, you have an opportunity to obey and do the things that God wants you to do. That's one simple example of how you can serve God. And as you get that email, and as you've heard these words, God is saying to you, you need to quit living in a cave. You need to get back out and represent me. You need to make a difference. That's what it means to be committed. It means to get out of our comfort zone and get into the faith zone and do the things that God wants us to do and the things that will best accomplish his mission and his purpose for our lives. We're looking at our third lesson here, the fruit of our choices, and this is verse 7, 8, and 9 of Genesis 12. So if you're looking with me there, here's what it says. And I'm going to read to you verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give you this, I will give this land to your descendants. Now remember, Abram is following him and God is making promises. I will give this promised land to you and your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. Abraham had choices to make. He had decisions to make. Do I obey God or do what I want to do? Do I reorder my life or keep living my life in a pagan, sin, self-centered, saturated society? Choice is ours. But when we obey him, God brings fruit to those choices of obedience. But in the same token, 
if we disobey God, God causes, he presents opportunities. We choose to live our own life, do our own thing, shutting God out of it. There will be fruit in those choices also. Notice that God said, I will. I will give this land to your descendants. He doesn't say I might. He doesn't say I could. He doesn't say I'll think about it. I'll get back to you. If God's told us to do something and we obey, he will do the thing that he's asked us to do. Grace Church is an example of that. God simply asked me to step out of my comfort zone well over 25 years ago and create a different kind of church that would minister to younger families who are not connected to church and who have really, who are like Abraham, living in a pagan culture, secular culture. When we step out in faith, he blesses us. Now, if he's asked us to do something, and we make a decision not to do it, there are consequences to that. There is fruit of your disobedience also. God's plan for our life is always bigger than just our life. God wants to use you to impact others. He wants to use you to leave a legacy in the future. Abraham had a journey of faith. 1,200 miles he walked. Our choices produce fruit that will impact others on a much larger scope than we can see or imagine. Today, you cannot see the end of your life, but God can. When God asks you to do something, whether it's serve in your church or to serve in your community, you can't see the immediate results of that decision, but God can. So we move forward in faith, doing the things that God has asked us to do, knowing that he will produce fruit out of that. It may not be fruit that we see in our lifetime. It may be fruit that happens in the life of somebody else or in a community or in a culture. We see this as a result of Abraham's obedience. Three different faith groups acknowledge him as a founder, uh, the uh, the founding father of their faith. Abram is held up as an example of faith for every Christian. This is the way God wants us to live. Obeying him, doing the simple things that he's asked us to do, not questioning his will, reordering our life, sacrificing, serving. And when we do that, God blesses us as a result. The key verse of our church, of Grace Church, is Ephesians 3.20. We'll close with this verse. Listen to these words. Very similar to the story of Abraham. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now all glory to God. In life, you can accumulate all you want. Try to build a business. Try to accumulate money. Try to win awards. All glory ultimately goes to God all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. As we take steps of faith across the bridges that God presents to us, God will bless us. He is able to lead us across the bridge, across any obstacle. He is able to provide for us on the journey. God is able to bring about uh, miraculous deeds from the results of our life. He's able to impact others through us. We can, our brains aren't even big enough to ask or think or imagine all that God could do through the life of an obedient man. As we look at the life of Abram today, here's what we need to remember. All journeys begin with a single step. Journeys of faith begin with a step of obedience. If we do that, God will bless us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, that we would consider the things that you are asking us to do. We know that you want to use us. You want to use our church in, the, in this community and in, use us in the lives of our friends and family. So may we be obedient. Do the things that you're asking us to do, even though they seem small, even though we can't see the immediate fruit even though they may make us somewhat uncomfortable. In my whole life, Lord, you've not asked me to walk 1,200 miles. 
but in my life you've asked me to represent you wherever you lead me, and that I have done. May our people do that today also, and we look forward to more of these journeys with the faithful in the weeks to come. Bless us, use us to touch people's lives. We, I hope, Father, that our people will show up next Sunday in the community uh, choices that they have. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
great week. God bless you. We're going to close out the feed with some announcements.